Well, good evening. Welcome. Calvary Baptist Church, Wednesday night Bible study. How's everybody doing? Had a pretty good week? Anybody get a chance to go sledding this morning? Can you believe that little snow? Well, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into our Wednesday night Bible study. We're going to be in 1 Kings again. Father God, tonight we thank you that we can gather, Lord, to bride your church. We thank you that you have gifted us graciously. And Father, you have blessed us and you've seated us in the heavenlies with your son, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, with that understanding in mind, we come before you this evening to worship you and to praise you and to open up your word and to hopefully grow and learn from that. So guide us tonight as we study. Bless our fellowship afterward and our time of sharing a prayer request and praise. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Well, this evening we are going to be in 1 Kings chapter 21. You'd think we were studying through Kings, but we completely skipped chapter 20. Because there's nothing that deals with Elijah in chapter 20. It's a different prophet in chapter 20. So we'll come back maybe and pick that up at a later date. But we're going to keep moving with Elijah. And then we're going to look at Elisha and, and kind of compare their ministries as we go. Uh, great, great men of God back in the day. So... Uh, let me see if this is working. It is. So tonight we are going to be in Jezreel again. And if you'll notice, i got another map up here. So you have Jerusalem here. Here's the Dead Sea. you got the Jordan Valley Rift, Sea of Galilee, Mount Carmel. Jezreel Valley is right next to it, right in there. So this is the area where we're at. Jezreel is the city um, that we're going to be looking at this evening. We're going to be looking at Naboth's Vineyard. Now, speaking of Naboth's Vineyard, it's a beautiful lush land. There's another picture up there. You can see it's, this is a modern day, obviously a modern day picture. They weren't taking many pictures back in Elijah's day. Um, but, but you see it's a beautiful valley. Um, and it's situated on a slope, this, this person here says. And, and they've actually discovered a winery in the area. And I know what you're probably thinking. You've been to Gatlinburg and you, you know, maybe you did the winery tour or, or you've seen wineries. And you think, okay, I know what a winery looks like. Well, it's completely different. Than, than what you would expect. This is a picture of a winery, and I have one more picture after this that has it labeled. But this is the winery that they believe could have been uh, Naboth's Vineyard's winery because this is ancient. It's, it's extremely old, and they would keep, keep using these because a lot of work went into them. So let's take a look at some of the detail of this winery. Um, it says here that A is a treading floor. See this big square? It's a place where you can put the grapes and then tread out the grapes. And, and normally the, the wineries, the vats, would then run down into a catch pool like that. And you can see there's a little crack here that lets B catch it. And then C is vat number two. And so they would move it from there to there, getting it more down into the regular juices. And then D here is a deep basin where they could have saved a lot of it. And then E is bedrock mortars. And so... This is, a, this is a winery. This is where they would tread out the grapes, and, and the juice would flow into one vat, then they would move it over into another vat. Now, most of the wine in this day, um, unless it was what they called mingled wine, and mingled wine, they would add a, a higher alcohol content to it, uh, kind of to bring the spirit level a little bit higher. But because of the grape skins that automatically have um, what's required for fermentation, um, it would ferment on its own, and it, it, was, a, it was a weaker grade of wine, it wouldn't be like, y'all remember the days of Reuniti, right? I don't even know if they still make that anymore, but I can remember when I was growing up, there were Reuniti commercials all the time. So this, they believe, could be Naboth's Vineyard's winery, and it would be near where the palace of Ahab would have been. And so that's kind of the topic tonight, and, and I don't know if it is or not. I don't know how you prove that unless they found, you know, Naboth's winery engraved on something. But, but that's how they looked in that day. It was a real simple place. It's like if you study about threshing floors where they'd bring the wheat in and they'd thresh the wheat, it was usually a flat rock. It was elevated where the wind could blow and they would, they would beat that grain off of the, of the chaff and then they would take winnowing forks and throw it in the air and then the wind would blow the chaff away and the grain would then fall back down because it's heavier. Uh, same kind of thing. They just used the land around them to do what they needed to do, uh, not necessarily building structures and things like we do today. So let's take a look at this text. Um, as we get into this. So we're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 21. Verses 1 through 3 says. Now sometime later. Because there's a story in chapter 20. Sometimes later there was an incident. Involving a vineyard belonging to Naboth. The Jezreelite. 
The vineyard was in Jezreel, close to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Ahab said to Naboth, let me have your vineyard to use for a vegetable garden since it's close to my palace. I will, in exchange, I will give you a better vineyard or if you prefer, I will pay you whatever it's worth. So you see, it's a, it's a decent request from a king. He wants to offer him money for his vineyard and, and it's right next to his palace and he, he wants to make a vegetable garden where there's a vineyard. Now, I already see a problem with that. If I don't know if anybody in here has ever grown grapes, but I mean, there's quite an investment in a vineyard as far as bringing in the plants, taking care of these plants, pruning these plants and getting to where they produce on a regular basis. And, and the king wants to come in and get this great vineyard that, that Naboth has and make a vegetable garden. He wants to get rid of the plants that are there. And, and, and it's probably been there for a long, long time. Uh, verse 3 says, But Naboth replied, replied, The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my ancestors. Now that's an interesting reply to a king, isn't it? The Lord forbid it. Well, let's think about what's going on here. Remember when they moved into the land, they broke the land up by tribes. And all the land that was given to a particular tribe was supposed to stay with that particular tribe. That land was their inheritance. It was given to that family from the Lord. As a matter of fact, if you had to sell your land or, or do something along that line so that you could pay your bills... They had the jubilee year that came along. And at the, in the end of the jubilee year, or beginning of the jubilee, all land went back to the previous owners, to the people that God had given it to. So basically, the plot of land was supposed to stay in the family forever. So if Naboth had given up this vineyard and then taken a, another vineyard that Ahab was going to give him, depending on where they were at in the jubilee cycle, in 50 years, he would have lost that vineyard back to the original family so it wouldn't have lasted long anyway and then try to get your land back from the king right try to go tell the king that's my vineyard and i want it back especially if he's already given you another one so there's a lot that goes in but 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 i want you to picture this as we go into this story and why it's so important this is an inheritance this is something that the lord had given them it was an inheritance from the lord now think about trading off an inheritance who do you think about i think of esau Remember Jacob and Esau? Remember at that time Esau went hunting and he, he, didn't, he didn't catch anything and he was starved to death and he came home and, and his brother, his younger brother by moments, because they were twins, was cooking porridge. And he said, I'm starving to death. Let me have that porridge. And what did Jacob say? Jacob said, sure, I'll feed you some of this porridge for your birthright. Remember that? Well, the birthright was something that the Lord had given the Israelites that they were supposed to practice. And what the birthright amounted to is because they didn't have um, Medicare. They didn't have government programs like that. The birthright, one of the things in the birthright was the older brother got a double portion. Because with that double portion, the older brother also took care of the aging parents. And so he would inherit the tents of the father and he would inherit the, 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 the things that the father had. The other one's got a section of it, but he would get a double portion. And what he was to do with that was take care of his parents and, and make sure that they're okay. And, and, and so it meant nothing to Esau. And, and that's something that the Lord had instituted. That was something that the Lord had given these people. And it was a birthright. And Esau, it meant nothing to him. He says, what good is a birthright if I'm going to die of, die of starvation? Well, that's probably a little bit dramatic, don't you think? After one hunting trip failing, he probably was going to starve to death. Um, they had, you know, they had goats and they had flocks and they had ways to eat. He just wanted some of that right now. And the birthright meant little to him. Well, Naboth is not like that. So here we are. We're in Israel. Remember that. We're in the northern ten tribe kingdom, Israel. They've already separated. In Israel, we know that there was one wicked king after another. We have Omri, Ahab's predecessor, who was wicked. And Ahab is wicked, and, and so we've seen nothing but wickedness in Israel. But here's this Israelite of the northern tribe who still cares, still cares about the things of God. So what does he say? The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my ancestors. This property had probably been in his family. This vineyard had probably been tilled by his father and maybe even by his grandfather. The, the, like I say, the grapes were probably old and it had been taken care of and it was something that they had that had a constant income from is the way they sustained their self. And it had meaning to him. And one of the greatest parts of the meaning was that it was God's inheritance for him. This was God's plan. 
So Ahab asked for something he shouldn't have asked for. But it's probably okay to ask. Because they did trade off land. It just had to go back at Jubilee year. And so it probably wasn't that big a deal that he asked. But you see Naboth's reply. So Ahab went home sullen and angry because Naboth the Jezreelite had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my ancestors. He lay on his bed sulking and refused to eat. Y'all got a pretty good picture of Ahab? You know what's worse than a spoiled child? A spoiled man. A spoiled adult. What did he do? He went home, lay on his bed, and kicked his feet in the air. He went home sullen, lay on his bed, sulking, and what did he do? Refused to eat. This is the king. This is the guy that's supposed to be the leader, the godly head of the ten northern tribes. And what does he do when he doesn't get his way? He pouts. Now, he had two palaces. This is one of his other palaces that he's at here in Jezreel. He had another palace. So it's like he had plenty. But have you ever seen somebody that had plenty, but it wasn't enough? He, he saw Naboth's vineyard, and he said, hmm, I'd sure like to have that. Well, that'd be a good place for me to grow me some taters. I could get me some get tomatoes going there. I wouldn't have to walk far from my palace to get me some vine ripened tomatoes or whatever he was going to grow in his vegetable garden. It just happened to be close. And in his mind, it made good sense. And so he asked for something he shouldn't have asked for. And he was told simply, no. What did he do? He went home and pouted. This is the king. Went home. Things haven't changed much, have they? Have you ever seen a grown person not get what they want when they got a case of the wants? He didn't need it. He's got plenty. He's got servants. He's got palaces. He's got places. He's, he's got influence. He's got everything that you could possibly want in this day and age as a king. But the only thing he can focus on is Naboth's vineyard. He wants it so bad that he's now home pouting. Boy, can you draw some conclusions from that? We haven't changed a lot, have we? You ever want something you're not supposed to want? You know what the Bible calls that? Coveting. Coveting. That's not admiring what other people have. Coveting is wanting what they have. What's the 10th commandment say? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, the donkey, the camel, or anything. that Don't want what your neighbor has. And, and the Bible calls that the same, it's the same sin as witchcraft. Coveting. Coveting is wanting what you're not supposed to have. Now think about that. You probably don't hear a lot of sermons on thou shalt not covet, right? Because that kind of gets in a lot of our back pockets, doesn't it? To want that thing just because we don't have it. And, and it's, okay to have, it's okay to have plans and have desires and, and admire things and say, well, I really do like my neighbor's new car. But if you can't function in your mind and you can't go about your everyday life because your neighbor's got a new car and you've got to have one to keep up with. Have you all ever seen that happen? I've seen it happen in churches. It's like, I don't know, new car season comes. And, you know, new cars start popping up in the parking lot. <laughs> it's interesting to watch. You know, one person, the next person, the next. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with getting a new car. One time, get a car, get a car. But some people have to keep up. Some people have to compete. They, they get the newest and the latest and the greatest phone. And they think it is the best thing since sliced bread. And then somebody in church comes in or somebody in the, in the workplace comes in and they've got the model just up from it. I have a knack for buying a model of phone that's being replaced the next month. And paying full price for the thing. And then a new one comes out and it's the same price. And I'm like, if I'd have waited one month. If I'd have waited one month. And now I just run them until they die. It's just easier that way. So here he is. He went home sullen and angry because of Naboth. Um, I've skipped a verse. I sure did. Let me see if I can go back and pick that up. Nope. I left it out of there. Okay, so here's what happened. He's laying on his bed and he's sullen, he's complaining, he's whining, and in comes Jezebel. And Jezebel says, honey, what's the matter? What's more wrong with mama's big boy? Why aren't you eating? He's a king. He should be eating, right? Why aren't you eating? Why are you hanging out in your bed chain? And he answered her because I said to Naboth, the Jezreelite, sell me your vineyard or... Or if you prefer, I'll give you another vineyard in his place. But he said, I will not give you my vineyard. That's what he said. So Jezebel comes in. Now Jezebel's involved. It's not going to go good for Naboth. And so that's what's happening. He, he's in. He's, he's moaning and he's complaining. And, 
And, and then Jezebel's wife said, is this how you act as the king over Israel? Boy, she's calling him on the carpet, isn't she? Get up and eat. Cheer up. I'll get you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. Now, there can't be anything good that's going to go on. And him being the upstanding king that he is, the representative of Yahweh Almighty, what does he say? She's going to get it. So what she do? She wrote letters in Ahab's name. Jezebel did. Placed his seal on them and sent them to the elders and nobles who lived in Naboth city with, with, with him. And he, here's what she wrote in the letters. Proclaim a day of fasting and, and seat Naboth, it should say feasting I think, Naboth in a prominent place among the people. But seat two scoundrels opposite him and have them bring in charges that he cursed both God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. Now this is the letter that Jezebel wrote. Her husband is having a pity party. He's having a little whiny fit. She comes in and says, is this how the king acts? I'll get this for you. You just never mind. I got this covered. She takes his signet ring. And when you seal something with a king's signet ring, it's official. And she writes a letter and seals it with the king's signet ring and sends it out to the leaders of the city of, of Naboth's hometown. Now, this is what she tells them to do. Set up a feast. Bring in Naboth, set him in a place of prominence, and then have two scoundrels. Must not be hard to find scoundrels. And have them testify that he's cursing God and he's cursing the king. Now, here's Jezebel. Did she believe in God? What's she using against Naboth? Naboth is a godly man. What is she using? She's using God's own word against him. Because how many scoundrels did she get? Say get? Two. You know why two? Witnesses. witnesses. The Bible says let a matter be established in the mouth of two witnesses. So she's using the word of God and the ways of God who she doesn't even believe in anyway. Remember she follows after Baal and Ashtaroth. She has all those people that serve her, the priests and all that. She's into that. She's not into Yahweh. She's not into God. But she knows how the people of Israel are. She knows they follow the word of God. So she says... Get two witnesses. Now, it's interesting. I have found that to be true in my own life, that the people who want to fight against God or, or disagree with God know what our Bible says. They know what our Bible... The devil knows what the Bible says. You remember that time that Jesus was fasting after his baptism and went out in the wilderness and the devil showed up? The devil showed up and quoted Scripture. Out of context and misapplied, but he quoted Scripture. He said, doesn't it say that if you... That the angels would catch you if you fell before you would even dash your foot on the, you know, on a stone. He's quoting scripture to Jesus. And, and this is what Jezebel's doing. He, she's using the culture and the time and the way people are. She knows it inside and out. Have you ever run into somebody who's this sneaky? Where they're, they have a plan the whole time they're working with you? Have you ever been around toxic people? And... And, and see how they'll work the situation. So she says, Pro proclaim a day. And let these two scoundrels do what they do. So the elders and the nobles who lived in Naboth City did as Jezebel directed in the letters that she had written them. So they just did what, you know, they got a letter from the king. They didn't know it come from her. They, they got a letter from the king. And the king said, here's what I want you to do. And so they did it. They proclaimed a fast and, and seated Naboth in a prominent place among the people. Then two scoundrels came and sat opposite him and brought charges against Naboth before the people, saying, Naboth has cursed both God and the king. So it's established in the mouth of two witnesses. It must be truth because these two guys said it happened. And so what did they do? They took him outside the city and stoned him to death. Then they sent word to Jezebel, Naboth has been stoned to death. They sent word to Jezebel. They knew who was behind this. Even though she sent it with the king's approval and sent it out as though it came from Ahab, these scoundrels knew Jezebel was behind it. They know who the power... Who do you think the power is behind the throne here? Obviously, Jezebel has a lot more influence than she should have over the king of God's people, Israel. Amen? But don't we see that even sometimes today, that people that should not have influence have influence over the people of God? And so... Um, that, my phone is up here making noise. Got it. Let me see. Yeah, I don't know why. Yeah, fun. Let's do this. Let's not do that. Okay. 
So the elders and the nobles who lived in Naboth said, so this is what they've done. They, said, they did as Jezebel directed. As soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned to death, she sent to Ahab, get up and take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, who refused to sell you. He is no longer alive but dead. And then the king who was grieved deeply cut to the core because this poor Jezreelite had been stoned to death. No, nope. when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, he got up. He got up off his bed. Okay, it's all good. Mama's a little boy, right? Got up and went down to take possession of Naboth's vineyard. So, so here's this king who's supposed to be the judge, who's supposed to do things that are correct and do things that are right. He's actually working politically behind the scenes. He could say his hands are clean, can't he? He could say, I didn't do it, Jezebel did it. Or these guys, these scoundrels, they lied. Let's take them out and stone them. No, what does he do? He gets an opportunity, and he seizes that opportunity because it was available to him, even though it was wrong. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. I bet you were wondering when Elijah was going to show up. The word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite and said, Go down and meet Ahab, king of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He is now in Naboth's vineyard where he's gone to take possession of it. So as soon as he goes down to the vineyard to take possession... Of this vineyard, the Lord picks up the phone and rings up Elijah and says, right now, at this moment, get up and go. He's in the vineyard. I love that. I love how God acted then. Now, we could ask the question, why didn't he act earlier? Why didn't he save Naboth's life? You know, you ever, you ever wonder those kind of things? We wouldn't have the story if it went that way. I'd say a whole lot of things happen like this, but we don't know anything about it. We just happen to know about this time when the government took property from somebody in an underhanded way. Mm -hmm. Say to him, this is what God says to Elijah. This is what the Lord says. Have you not murdered a man and seized his property? Now wait a minute, who did the murder? The people of the town, set up by Jezebel and two scoundrels. Who did God hold accountable? The king. That's right. God held the king accountable because the king was complicit in everything going on. Even though he could say, remember what Pilate said when Jesus was before him? Do as you will. This has nothing to do with me. Right? You have murdered a man, seized his property. Then say to him, this is what God tells him. This is what the Lord says. In the place where the dogs licked up, licked up Naboth's blood, dogs will lick up your blood. Yes, yours. Isn't that something? You offer a king, see that, can you? Ahab said to Elijah, so you have found me my enemy. I love that. He knows who Elijah is. Remember we talked about Elijah's coat? Then we talked about when when he placed it on Elisha, it's a woolly coat, it's, it's long and it's hairy and it's something he was recognized by. Uh, probably the same situation here. Ahab said to Elijah when he walks up to him, so you have found me my enemy. Now, is Elijah the king's enemy? What does Elijah represent? God, truth, honesty, righteousness. So if, if the, the righteous person is your enemy, where does it tell you that you're standing? Elijah's the man of God, but what does Ahab call him? His enemy. He won't let him have any fun whatsoever, will he? He says, I have found you, he answered, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. He says, I'm going to bring disaster on you. I will wipe out your descendants and cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free. So hear what God said. I'm going to end your dynasty. Now what matters more to a king? The legacy. Hand it off. The king, the son, the next son, the next son, the next son. If you watch any of the, the, the crown and some of those shows that are on now, you understand how, how important bloodlines are. You also come to find out how many people had to die so that another bloodline could come in. I mean, it's, it's, it's a big deal. And so he says, we're going to cut off every descendant of Ahab, every slave or free. And I will make your house like that of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and like Bashak, son of Ahijah, because you have aroused my anger and you've caused Israel to sin. Caused Israel to sin. So you see, who does God hold accountable? The king, the one who's in charge, the one who's supposed to be looking after this. But who all gets credited with the sin? Israel. You see, sin, you, nobody's an island unto their self. Nobody, nobody sins in their own little corner. It's just, it's just me. It affects everything. You know, and you hear that said 
Um, God judged Israel. God judged Sodom, Gomorrah, and all the other plains on, on all the cities on the plain because of what was going on in them. And, 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 and God holds countries and nations and tribes and tongues accountable for what's being allowed to go on inside their realms. Isn't that interesting? Sometimes a whole group gets judged. Verse 23, and also concerning Jezebel, the Lord says, I love Elijah, dogs will devour Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Because she's the one that did this, right? She's the one that went down and stole from, from Naboth of Jezreel. She's the, one that went, she's the one that got all this done. And, oh, by the way, I'm going to wipe out all of your family, all of them, and I'm going to wipe off, I'm going to have dogs eat Jezebel too. Dogs will eat those belonging to Ahab who die in the city, and birds will feed on those who die in the country. In other words, none of you are going to escape. Then there's a parenthesis here. It says that there was never anyone like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel his wife. He behaved in the vilest manner by going after idols like the Amorites, and the Lord drove out before Israel. So, Ahab pretty wicked, isn't he? So is God's judgment just? Does Ahab have it coming? No matter what happens, you can't bring Naboth back, can you? There, it's just over with. And so what God's judgment on... But here's the interesting thing, and, and, I, and, I, and I have one more verse um, before we close. That uh, Two more verses. When Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and fasted. He lay in sackcloth and went around meekly. You imagine that? The king. You reckon Jezebel was happy with this? He tore his clothes and he and he and he put on sackcloth and he fasted and he lay in sack. So we got him earlier laying across his bed, not eating, because he didn't get his way. Now what's he doing? Now he's in sackcloth, he's tore his clothes, and he's not eating again. Now because he's 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 afraid and he's repentant. He lay in sackcloth and went around meekly. He wasn't proud. He wasn't arrogant. He was broken. He was contrite. Does that sound like a familiar Bible word? Listen to what the Lord says. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Have you noticed? I love the Bible. So God's talking to Elijah just like, you know, they've gone out to a coffee shop. And they're talking about whatever they're talking about. He says, have you noticed, Ahab, how he humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster in his day, but I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. So here's, here's another point in this long and twisted story before we, before we close, and then we'll have a conversation after we're discussing this. Um, Ahab, deserving of God's judgment? Yeah, yeah guilty, isn't he? What did he do? He repented, he was mournful, he was sorrowful, he was contrite, and God held off the judgment. God was merciful. Mercy is not getting what you've earned. Now sometimes we think that's unfair. Because as, as believers, we have to believe that if Adolf Hitler confessed his sins and asked Christ to save him, he would save him, right? It bothers us a little bit though, doesn't it? Or Charles Manson or Jeffrey Dahmer. Supposedly Jeffrey Dahmer did come to the Lord and got saved. And then he was killed in prison. We might struggle with that a little bit. Sometimes we struggle with God's mercy. Especially with something as heinous as the way Ahab was. I mean, it was just said in the scripture how crooked and perverse Ahab was. Yet when he repented, God is faithful and just. Remember that verse? If we confess our sins... God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, even the wickedness of Ahab. And he says, I will not bring this disaster on him in his day. But, you got to watch the buts in Scripture, right? I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. So is God judging the children ahead of time? He also knows what the children are going to do. They're going to be worse or as bad as they have, aren't they? They're going to get off and do things that are worse because of the home they were raised in or whatever reason. These kids are going to earn it on their own. 
And, and God brings it all to pass, just as he said. But he does forgive or stave it off Ahab in his day of judgment. Interesting thoughts, isn't it? Let's close with a word of prayer. And then I'd like to maybe do some questions or some thoughts on this teaching tonight. See how you feel about it, okay? Let's pray. Father God, tonight in Jesus' most powerful name, we thank you for all that you've given us. We thank you for the time that we can walk through Scripture. Lord, I pray that you'll help us make this passage that is 800 plus years before you were born, Jesus. And, and But the relevancy and the truth and the, the people are the same. Help us, Lord, to learn from this ancient writing and help us to live according to the truth that we understand. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.